Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 365th New Social Environment. I'm Ty Cooper, production assistant here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between Edward Zipko and Paul D. Miller. We are thrilled to have the poet Banga Areshina here, who will read to close today's program. A few quick notes before we get started. The Rail team will be helping out with tech if you have any questions. Closed captions are available by pressing the live transcript button at the bottom of the screen. Now we've started all of our events with two important acknowledgements. The first is that here in New York, we are on the Nafe Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. The second is an acknowledgement that Black Lives Matter. The heart of both of these acknowledgements is a commitment to the liberation of the oppressed and solidarity for all who struggle for freedom in recognition that when it comes to liberation, our histories never unfold in isolation, as said by the great Angela Davis. In that spirit, I, I encourage you all to check out this chat in just a moment for a living document of resources and actions. And now to introduce today's guest and host. Photographer, writer, and gallery director Edward Zipko is the co-founder and director of Super Chief Gallery an independent artist-run gallery with permanent large-scale warehouse locations in New York and Los Angeles. Encompassing a broad scope of contemporary art, Super Chief presents photography, illustration, painting, sculpture, performance, installation, animation, and digital art. Super Chief Gallery has a history of supporting artists from disparate scenes and collectives, enabling them to participate in a larger community. Super Chief Gallery is the world's first physical gallery space dedicated to NFTs. And composer, multimedia artist, and writer Paul D. Miller, also known as DJ Spooky, immerses audiences in a blend of genres, global culture, and environmental and social issues. Miller has collaborated with an array of recording artists, including Metallica, Chuck D., Steve Reich, and Yoko Ono. His 2018 album, DJ Spooky Presents Phantom Dance Hall, debuted at number three on Billboard Reggae, and he is an editor at large for the Brooklyn Rail. Paul, take it away. All right. Well, hey, first and foremost, I just want to say what's up, everybody. Good to see you. And um, here we are. Um, the a couple of days just after uh, the end of the war in Afghanistan and the sort of surreal uh, fires that have been going on throughout uh, the U.S. and the world. And then on top of that, all sorts of um, shenanigans with the geopolitical issues involving the pandemic. So uh, happy Tuesday. Um, <laughs> uh -huh. um, you know, it's been really a pleasure to see Ed's gallery. It's called Super Chief, and that's C-H-I-E-F, uh, Super Chief NFT. Um, because I'm uh, generally, I'm on Fifth Avenue and 11th Street, um, and I walk by their gallery, and I just wanted to say it was a pleasure to see a gallery in that area. Normally, a lot of the galleries are, are in, now in Tribeca or Chelsea, or, you know, obviously Brooklyn. Bushwick has all sorts of stuff happening as well. And it's been, um, you know, a really intriguing moment because the, during the pandemic, the whole NFT situation really took off and rejuvenated an entire sector of the online and digital arts in a way that really opened up um, far more independent um, artists than ever before. Of course, then we saw uh, major um, auction houses, Sotheby's, Christie's, and so on tune in. And of course, the largest auction so far was uh, Beeple's. Um, Mm -hmm. for 60 plus million dollars um and you know for anyone out there without the context a lot of this is based on blockchain technology that's enabled uh through ethereum and uh bitcoin those are the two top ones but there's also many other cryptocurrencies dogecoin zoco uh zcash um and so on ripple um and so on and so on so by way of context i just wanted to mention that um ed's gallery is one of the first uh, major galleries that both independent owned and independent run and based on fully engaged, uh, you know, blockchain and cryptocurrency approach to the arts. So Ed, thanks for joining us. Um, Thank you for having me. Let's, uh, let's riff for a second because you're obviously, you know, an interdisciplinary artist and it's great that you're um, an artist who's also running a gallery. Let's put that in context because um, galleries normally are run by, you know, art dealers who come in with a different approach, but because you're a creative, um, that might also add a different perspective. Do you want to riff on that? Like where you're from? How'd you get into it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, sure thing. Um, well, God, uh, back in 1999, I went to Pratt and that kind of introduced me to a huge community of artists that I got obsessed with. 
And it really kind of, you know, it was one thing to be part of the community and party and support other people's projects and roll out my own. But after like, I don't know, after 10 years of like hanging out, I kind of wanted to participate in a way that could add value and kind of like shoulder some of this stuff forward in a more cohesive way. So we started to really build uh, opportunities and galleries that could like help support them financially, you know, and really help kind of, I knew that there were opportunities there. I knew there were artists that I like really believed in, but I wanted to, I wanted to build something that could really support and kind of grow with them. And that was, that was the birth of all of this was just, how do we, how do we participate in a way that's like more than me taking pictures of the event, more than me helping like build out an event, but like, how do we, you know, how do we become a, a place to kind of foster that community? And then also, you know, coming out of like 2009, when the economic destruction of the, the whole stock market killed a lot of, uh, a lot of the careers that people were, were building, you know, it made it a lot harder to earn a living. And I think that that kind of situation made it really, really important to us to find a way to keep these communities together and reinforce that there's like, you know, there's a discourse that's, that's happening and there's an artist base that's really brilliant that should be supported. So we started there and got heavy into it. So let's talk about how you got started because I mean, thank you for the bio and background, but to make a leap from going from these kinds of interventions with photography and then making that, it's a big leap to set up a physical space Mm -hmm. and then use that physical space to sort of to catalyze an entire scene. Um, if one, one of my favorite independent galleries, which I'm, I think you guys resonate with, is the Fun Gallery, which was a, a, a very famous gallery that, you know, um, in the 80s. And mm-hmm. also people like, um, you know, there's, there's so many, Basquiat, uh, Frat Five Freddy, um, you know, Glenn O'Brien, um, a lot of major figures came out of that gallery. Um, and it was all just because it was like a quirky, um, 80s kind of situation founded by, um, well, she was a very wealthy family, uh, Patty Astor uh, sure. from the Astor family. Um, but you were striking me as an independent person. So let's, let's yeah. talk about you know, starting a gallery. I mean, that's a big deal. Can you, can you riff on that for a second? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think it was, it comes out of friend groups, you know, it comes out of circles of community and then really kind of like when, when the economy got tanked, Um, There were a lot of locations that opened up that were, well, not opened up, but became vacant, that it was really affordable to get a location and try to, you know, create kind of a house, you know, for places that, or for opportunities and for exhibitions that like, typically are, you know, it's very expensive to try and do this thing on like a legit level. And I think we started in a DIY kind of way, where it was about, you know, creating, um, large scale, but still really raw immersive spaces that different types of artists and different disciplines could kind of be in the same space and meet each other. And I think that kind of interaction where it wasn't straightforward, just paintings, it was like, we would get projectors, we would have musicians. It was about the different aspects of creatives in our community, having one location where it could all intersect. And I think that was really important because it's you know, I think something that really struck us was uh, when, when an artist would succeed, it really felt like they were getting kind of cherry picked out of our community. And then they lost their connections to those relationships. And I'd see them not really feel comfortable coming back to like, this was all during the 2000s. I'd see, you know, when street art and graffiti started really getting welcomed into the art world instead of kept at bay because they saw they could make a lot of money off of it. Um, They started actually, you know, supporting these artists that, you know, come from communities that were DIY and come from communities that didn't really have that kind of access to funds and money. So they'd be pulled out of their community and their friend group and the society that like we were a part of. And that, you know, that broke my fucking heart, man. Like that was something that really was hard because we were all trying to succeed but it seemed like this real double-edged sword that as soon as you succeed, you lose everything that you love getting to there. And for me, I was like, if we can build something that 
can grow as fast as our friends succeed and our artists succeed and kind of bring the whole community with it, then they'll never, you know, they won't leave. They'll know they have a home to come back to. They'll know there's something that's like tethering everyone still together. And that's been, that's been like kind of the, the role of our life, which is just like keeping this scene together and reinforcing it and then growing it from like going from New York to Los Angeles and finding artists that we love there and community that we love there. And then doing the same thing in Miami, like those three cities really, they're a big part of our core. And I think having there be like, having there be a place where you can see people break through and then see those people that have broken through, come back to do big projects in the community still. It's a, yeah, it's been a dream. So let's talk about, I mean, the, you're, one of the things that really struck me is that you guys are like, you're stakeholders in what some people now call a sort of a disruptive innovation. And mm -hmm. disruptive innovation, my motto these days is every crisis is an opportunity for innovation. What you've done is you've enabled independent artists, plus some established artists as well, mm -hmm. to rethink their stakeholder relationship to the gallery system. Oh, and right. because you're totally independent, plus you're an artist, Mm -hmm. Those are different perspectives than, say, for example, Larry Gagosian, you know, or, you know, the, or the Pace Gallery or something. Sure. Meanwhile, the economics of Ethereum and blockchain uh, based, um, you know, cryptocurrencies, of course, Bitcoin and Ethereum are the rock stars right now. But, um, you know, let's talk about the overlapping of physical space versus uh, digital space, because you're you, why have a physical space at all in a certain oh. sense? I mean, I think, well, two things. I think one the reason we got in like, you know, heavy for NFTs and dove in when that started to become really prevalent, I mean, not as prevalent as it is now, but back in like January, February, it was really that there was this, there was this watershed moment where suddenly there's a vehicle where not only are digital artists finally being accepted into the, the overarching art world, you know, like the larger art world, the same way that graffiti and street artists were welcomed in 20 years ago. They had to fight to get there. But as soon as they were in, it was this, this renaissance where everyone felt that ability to be creative, that, that drive to be creative because they saw there was a way to survive and prosper through that. So seeing that for digital art, when we've been like really trying to include digital artists in our, like our messaging and our, our, you know, our projects since 2015, 2016, the, uh, Besides that excitement, the real thing that kind of uh, the watershed moment of all of this is artist royalties. The fact that an NFT, an artist can make a piece of digital art that's an NFT, and every time it's sold, there's royalties going back to that initial artist, that creator. That's, that's unbelievable. You know, the fact that that hasn't existed till now in the, the creative arts in this way I mean, it just kind of made me really upset that our entire community has been leaving this much money on the table and hasn't fought for that to be a, a, an aspect of an artist's survival. You know, it's like a trope and a joke that they're, they're starving artists. And like, that's completely unacceptable. We've just let that happen. So now there's finally a mechanism in place that builds in royalties, reinforces royalties, and that makes it so artists can survive. So I think that really lit a fire under our ass to just dive in hard body, take it really seriously. And then from a lot of hard work and then very, you know, very lucky, plus a lot of hard work. We worked really hard to be lucky. Um, <laughs> we, we actually, we beat Shanghai by one day to be the first NFT gallery space in the world. So that really kind of leapfrogged all of our artists to this, uh, this moment where, you know, in like over, over 200 newspapers, magazines, nightly news, uh, network television and uh, network news for like CBS and Fox and Tokyo have all had us on the news talking about how this is the artwork of the future. And these are all underground artists that we've been showing for so long, finally getting the spotlight on them. Mm -hmm. And even though they've been in museums and whatnot, watching them break through to mass market, mass culture has always been the dream. The goal was always to dent culture. 
Right. So let's let's unpack that, because I think disruptive innovation, especially with something as um, ambiguous as the art market, um, art is usually based on scarcity. You know, if you think about painting, sculpture, if it, in fact, many artists, when they die, their art becomes more, more, uh, you know, exactly. expensive. Yeah. Um, and then they, say, for example, uh, the reason I was bringing you guys up in the fun gallery is that Patty Astor, when she started it, um, she had artists like Keith Haring, um, you know, Basquiat. Also, you know, uh, Futura 2000, Fab Five Freddy, you know, they were indie artists at that time. Yeah. And the East Village had a community that in the 80s, um, you had people like even, there was a band called the Talking Heads or, you know, or CBGBs. Yeah. So man. yeah, you guys are resonant with that in, in a fun way that I really think the digital overlap um, creates a new dimension right now. So yes. when you were talking about one thing I want to uh, sort of pivot back to is artist royalties. Many people in the audience may not be aware of this, but once your work sells, that's mm -hmm. kind of it, usually. And I'm using air quotes, normal. Yeah. Um, and, and then it goes to auction, yeah. if the piece sold and it went to auction and it sells for a hundred times what it sold for initially, mm -hmm. you know, if, if you sold it for a thousand and it's selling for a hundred thousand at auction, that hundred thousand doesn't touch the artist at all. Like none of that hits the artist's bank account. And that's tragic, you know, like this is, this is a moment where that's coming from that's coming from an artist's creativity and there's no system built or there was till now, no system built that kind of reinforces and gives a, a safety net to that artist. There was no sustainability built into that, that whole process. And I think now when you sell something as an NFT, um, the kind of default royalties, there's, you can adapt it, but the default is 10%. So if that, you know, if you sell your artwork for a thousand dollars, and in the future, someone sells it for $100,000, you're getting 10,000 out of that 100. Mm -hmm. And it's not like you have to send them an invoice that goes directly to your, you know, your crypto wallet. Okay, so let's unpack the crypto wallet issue as well, because yeah. I, I want to make sure the audience, um, the, the Brooklyn Rail demographic generally has one foot mainly in like indie you know, contemporary art, and then one foot in kind of approaches to innovation and thinking about design and architecture and so on. So mm -hmm. that's that some of the working terms Ed was just mentioning. NFT stands for non-fungible token. Yeah. Art is generally not considered fungible. A, a dollar bill is fungible because you can trade it for something else. It's not like, except if you're a Burning Man, maybe you could trade a poem for like a cheeseburger, you know, <laughs> but um, it's true. You know, when, <laughs> but what you're doing is kind of in a very, very authentic way, creating a, a new portal for a more independent artists. Yeah. Um, represent their work and have a stakeholder relationship in the evolution of the financing, yes. which is a big deal because a lot of artists lose that kind of revenue stream. And I think you're, you're, the term meme economy comes to mind a lot these days. Um, a lot of people are now calling the NFT. Walk us through, if person X walks into your gallery, what are they gonna see and what would they buy and or what curation happens because a lot of it's digital. Um, sure. and you have an ocean of digital stuff online. So yeah, they, I mean, walk those definitely. Through that. You got it. That's definitely our zone is curation. Like that's, that's our, you know, our core is our, our curation. So we show and represent uh, about 1400 artists these days uh, over the course of doing this for a decade because we build relationships and we maintain those relationships. So the idea now is if you come into our NFT gallery space on 56 East 11th Street, you'll be able to see digital artwork on these very, very thin digital canvases. And that's basically like a hyper-modern version of a television. It's as thin as your phone. It is hung flush to the wall. And they, they show this artwork in 4K. And the way that we have it set up is uh, we have a hardware partner named Wim that's like it'll be going to market in december so like right now we're really the only place in the world you can see these types of devices but it allows you to see the artwork as the artist intended which is really important to us i think a lot of people that are collecting nfts are used to the idea of seeing it like on your phone or seeing it on a laptop perhaps and collecting it but not really living with it and for us the the real purpose of this gallery is to show the show the people that are interested in learning about this and want to understand the outreach, but also want to see what it looks like to live with it. And I think that's really important. So we have about, we have about 20 of these digital canvases and you can see 
artwork that is, some of them are square, some of them are rectangle. We have a couple of 4K projectors. And really it's just, what does digital artwork look like as the artist intended it to look like? And then what does it look like when the collector has it in their home? I think something that people get really excited about is they may be following one of the artists that we show. And we've released, you know, like I believe uh, just over a hundred different NFTs to this point. And I think when people come over, they're excited to see which ones we've chosen to put on the walls that week, depending if there's a solo show, a group show, or what we're kind of putting up in between those exhibitions. But what's really cool is sometimes like someone will come and they say, I wanna see, uh, I'd love to see the artwork that Swoon did for her solo show, her solo NFT exhibition. And really with like, you know, the, the touch of a few buttons on a cell phone, we can flip the entire room and show all of her exhibition kind of at the drop of a hat. So that's really futuristic. And the idea that, you know, exhibitions that happen at Super Chief Gallery NFT kind of exist forever. And you're able to kind of, you know, we can show you something new, but we can actually also kind of go back in time and show you what we did a few months ago um, effortlessly. So let's, let's again, I'm sorry to keep wanting to unpack, unpack. but major, major artists like, uh, so of course, uh, Banksy, Damien Hirst, you name it. Of course, people, uh, people, um, I, I keep wanting to say people, but it's Beeble, um, have been selling work for millions and millions of dollars. Certainly. And the intriguing thing about what you're doing is you're representing 1400. I mean, and, and again, for the audience, that's a massive amount of artists. Most galleries would have maybe max 20 artists. Yeah. Or, I mean, just 30 artists. Just You have to deal with the entire ecosystem for each artist. You have to keep track of all of the different financial and aesthetic and curated situations, um, which becomes a tremendous amount of work. And there's again, this is what I call a sticky ecosystem. Uh, once you're involved with cryptocurrency, um, you're dealing with blockchain aesthetics. Blockchain is basically math. Um, so all of this art is actually an engagement with a kind of a, a, a kind of an everyday engagement with, with uh, encryption, because you know, that's basically what blockchain stuff is based on. Mm -hmm. So for people in the audience, I mean, Ed, I, one thing I'd love to hear from you is the near future of this stuff. Um, we've been seeing a crisis um, amongst not only the normal financing of, of you know, galleries and art, um, the pandemic obviously wiped out quite a bit of biz, small businesses Certainly. Um, and people really had to innovate and pivot uh, yeah. and people became more digital during the pandemic. Do you have any thoughts on that and the, the, the evolution of digital art in the last year and a half? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, we, we are definitely uh, a case study in that same situation. You know, typically our galleries are large warehouse art spaces where we do you know, giant art parties and the exhibitions are typically like, you know, it's a 7,000 square foot warehouse where we'll have like 1,500 people come by and do a giant party. And then the exhibition kind of acts as, you know, um, you know, it's, it's almost museum scale. You know, these are large art spaces. And that wasn't appropriate in any stretch of the imagination last year. So we pivoted hard. We were very, very... I mean, with our situation being so community-based, it was a nightmare that if we continued, we would be actually like detrimental to our community. Like I had a nightmare, it was a nightmare that I would kill like, uh, you know, somebody would come to an event and get sick in that way. Like, no, you know what I mean? That's just, so we, in March of last year, early, early, as this was just getting serious, um we that was our last month we got out of another six and we had a six and a half more years on our lease and i started negotiating in march to get out of it because i saw how big this was getting and how serious it was and i didn't want to have our our methodology our business model and our relationships go through that kind of situation i wanted to just find a way that we could safely engage our audience that we could continue to support our artists and find ways like, you know, pivot. So for us, that was really, really big. We got out of that. We, in the meantime, before we opened up the NFT gallery, because we were still trying to figure out what we wanted to do, we opened up a retail gallery space on Spring Street in Soho. So in, in Soho, it was, 
it was wonderful. You know, it was a lot smaller of a gallery space. It was like 1500 square feet. The exhibitions that we did there were great, but it was definitely like it, it wasn't helping us answer the question that we've been trying to answer for the last five years anyways, is which speaks to what you were talking about, about having 1400 artists that we care about and, you know, we show, how do you scale? You know, and it was, you know, we were doing exhibitions with Juxtapose that were like, I made, I made jokes as the titles of exhibitions where it was like, <laughs> there will never be a gallery big enough, was like the title of the show. And for that event, we had 1900 people come to the opening party and it, there was like an ocean of people in the room. And that was really exciting and great. But like, how do you go past that? Like, I don't, I mean, if we have to rent the Javits Center to have an art show, it gets kind of ludicrous. So we were looking into how we can be global and be engaging a global market and also be showing global artists without having it be constantly focused about overhead shipping and you know shipping back <laughs> artwork that is coming from across the world and the idea kind of it was a beautiful moment when we realized that there was this this synergy between a new art form which is we've been fighting for five years now to say that digital art is the you know it's the art form of our generation because whether you are making a sculpture or a video or a film or a photograph or anything it's going to be shown on a phone that's how the majority of people are going to see your work and for that to be a concept that was something that was really important to us to try and crack that like how do we how do we engage that and then also get ahead of it so we can find really smart positioning for our artists so let's put it this way Everything you were just talking about, I, I feel like is an authentic engagement with immersive media. Your cell phone has now become a portal. And one could argue that physical space is almost something of an afterthought. It's almost like it's an unconvincing red herring. I mean, when I say red, red herring, I mean, I mean, like, more people will experience your video or your, uh, your <laughs> photography, or anything on, on a cell phone than will fit in physical space. It's true. Um, and the market economy that we have been experiencing over the last, since about, I'd say since the 2008 financial crisis, people tend to forget Bitcoin and uh, Bitcoin really came into its own after the 2008 financial crisis. Definitely. And it's, it's, a, it's a logarithmic uh, increase I mean, in value. I mean, it's, it's yeah. not like 40,000 for Bitcoin. Yep. Um, Ethereum is definitely younger, but if you think about Satoshi, Satoshi Nakamura, uh, Nakamoto, who, nobody even knows who he is mm -hmm. um, versus Victor Buterin, who is the inventor of Ethereum. Mm -hmm. These are figures who were thinking about financial services as an encryption model for an anonymity. Yeah. Um, and one thing I'd love to hear you talk about is like the cell phone now for viewing art, most people are going to be scanning they're you know, doom scrolling, you know, just kind of like yeah. always scrolling through things. What's the, what do you think of artists like Richard Prince and like his appropriations from Instagram or for that matter, any of your artists that you think re resonate with that kind of immersive media approach? Because I mean, 1400 artists, for most people that would just blow their mind with, if you have to deal with that every day, it's a lot of people. It's a lot. Um, I mean, I love Richard Prince. I think uh, Richard Prince and also uh, Ryder Rips. I think it's like really, I think they're conceptual artists that push the limits of what is uh, copyright law and what is the way that we understand the limitations or the theoretical boundaries on what is and isn't art. And I think that we need those types of people that are pushing that envelope and then kind of like, you know, uh, putting for those two, because they're not anonymous, um, they're putting their ass on the line, you know, like Richard Prince spends a great deal of time in court, you know, <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's rough. Um, I know that they want that. I know that that's like part of their whole thing, but it's also, I think it's, I think it's about the discourse. I think that so much of this is just about the, you know, pushing these movements, pushing that discourse so people can like really learn where the boundaries are and learn like, you know, how close you can get to the, the oven, you know, before you get burnt. <laughs> I think it's nice when they do it with their hand, you know, instead of yeah. it being everyone else's. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, physical objects are really part of the basic vernacular of art. 
most sure. people, if, but the funny thing is if you go to a museum, you actually, there's a lot of statistics that show your average person stands in front of a painting or sculpture like the Met, for example, less than six seconds. And um, when they emerge uh, on their phone and they're scrolling through a website, they'll scroll through the phone or the website for far longer, minutes perhaps sometimes. Sure. So you have an attention economy and attention scalability mm -hmm. built into how people experience the art that you're showing. Um, so let's unpack some of the, the near future issues because you just had a show with Swoon, who's a wonderful artist. Yes. Um, walk us through that because she has one foot in the more traditional media and then mm -hmm. one foot, is, this is one of her, I believe was her first NFT. And um, then you have, yeah, well, go ahead. Well, we released her first NFT, her Genesis, as part of our opening group show. Mm -hmm. And then we followed up with her two months later to do her first full solo NFT exhibition. Okay. Yeah, I think that it's, um, I think that it's really important to value both. I don't think that this is built, I don't think NFTs are built to replace tangible reality. I think that we're getting a, an add-on, you know, we're getting a plus to this situation. And I think that it's also really wonderful for artists like Swoon in multiple ways. I mean, first off, you're talking about someone who puts work out on the streets that's very ephemeral and it's, you know, its intention is that it is there to uh, experience nature and have a temporal existence. Like it's not there forever. You know, there may be graffiti that's done on top of it or it might rain for a few months and then just be destroyed. If you caught it and you were part of it, that was wonderful. But the preservation of that digitally allows for it to live on. And then another thing that was really cool about working with Swoon is that, you know, a big chunk of that exhibition was um, experimental filmmaking that she's been doing that she released a few years previous with Deitch. And it was that, that stop motion animation project that she'd done where it was a 17 minute <clears throat> short film based of like several stop motion vignettes. And I think this is definitely uh, an incredible moment for her because she made that project with no intention of selling it or no intention of being able to sell it. She did it because she wanted to experiment, to try to create a visual that she hadn't experienced before. And then also to speak to subjects that needed movement, you know, and need to be able to tell a story in a different way. And this was the first time that she was able to actually, you know, see revenue from that, that allowed her to support her new project, which is she's trying to make a feature film of that same type. So I think being able to, bring that type of work out in a digital way and then find that there's you know there's art sales there that can help support that artist was like i mean that was incredible mm -hmm. and that just you guys put that together it was the, the average length of a show is a couple of days right but then, um, and then it just migrates to the website that we typically do um about a week so her exhibition was actually up for two weeks and the uh, we did a little bit longer for hers because, you know, she's an old friend and also we're very, very proud to be exhibiting her and the work is beautiful. So, you know, based off of the, uh, we started with a week, but there was a lot of people that just kept asking. So we, you know, we made it flexible and we stretched it out a little bit longer. Okay. And so well, let's, let's pivot for a second to talk about, I mean, there's terms like the metaverse, which is coined by um, the science fiction writer, Neil Stevenson, or cyberspace, people tend to forget, was coined by the science fiction writer, William Gibson. Mm -hmm. um, metaverse is a term even Mark Zuckerberg's talking about right now, which I find really intriguing. Um, you know, there's a whole layer of this intangibility that people really aren't sure what to deal with. And the, you, what you guys have done with uh, combining economics of uh, cryptocurrency with, with art collecting is really uh, pretty, uh, I think, just radically innovative. Um, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on like, the, you, like you've sold normal work in a normal okay. way. Do you prefer per, you know, cryptocurrency or like if someone walked in your gallery with cash or cryptocurrency, which would you prefer? I mean, um, I'm just, you know, I'm just being blunt. Like, <laughs> yeah, no, being, being blunt is fine. I would take crypto. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, okay. cash is great. You know, it's, uh, you know, they, the old story of cash is king was, uh, was great till crypto walked in because mm -hmm. I don't know. I, of course, it's a roller coaster and there are good days in the market and there are bad days in the market, but it's very hard to look at the, it's hard to look at this um, from a few steps back and see the wide view of the, the track record for the past few years and see 
anything other than a futurist movement. Okay. It, it's very clear that there's, I mean, we're watching, um, well, to be very, you know, another thing that's kind of strange about this, this new world, is that with crypto, people talk about money. And in typical art gallery sense, it is not appropriate to say how much something sold for, say how much like an exhibition made. It's not ever something we've done. It was always like, well, the exhibition sold out and we're all happy, but you don't talk about numbers. It's like mm -hmm. a little bit gauche, you know? And in, uh, in crypto, it is not. In crypto, they wanna hear it. They wanna, it's like a video game. Everybody wants to hear how well an exhibition did, what were the numbers on it. And like in that context, I can tell you that, you know, Swoon's exhibition, and also I think the reason why you can tell people and that it's part of the conversation is that it's visible on the, on the website. Like all of this is very front and center. When you look at, uh, when you go to Super Chief Gallery NFT and you look at our collection on OpenSea, you can see how much has been sold. You can see the value that it was sold at. You can see how many pieces have uh, been collected. And it's very, uh, it's very front and center. So okay. in this example, uh, Swoon's exhibition sold over $100,000 worth of NFTs, which was wonderful and amazing. But since then, the value of the Ethereum that was used to pay has doubled. <laughs> so, you know, that's pretty great for the artist when you're talking about, you know, hanging tight with the money for two months and watching it double. That's, those are significant numbers any way you scratch it. So yeah. if you walked into my gallery, I would say, feel free to pay in crypto. Okay. And so like the reason I keep bringing up crypto versus the normal financial mechanisms is that Sotheby's, for example, has been doing a whole series. They've, I believe they've even bought on a curator for their crypto uh, oriented or NFT oriented art. Mm -hmm. Sotheby's as well. Um, so you guys are like the David versus Goliath kind of situation here. And it's tough. It's, Let me cut you in. Me, uh, yeah. The way that we're approaching all of this is actually uh, very uh, agnostic. Mm -hmm. So we actually worked with Christie's. Mm -hmm. So when Christie's did their first uh, crypto punk auction, we were the physical location for the, uh, the event. And we kind of were you know, acting as host at our gallery for 150 CryptoPunk owners and different DAOs. And just really for us, we've always kind of treated our gallery as, a, uh, as an island with bridges, mm -hmm. you know? And that way we can work with other marketplaces. We can work with you know, institutions like Christie's to either curate or facilitate the gathering of these uh, these communities because they don't really know how to speak to them or present the work in a, a way that um, we've been doing it for a long time. Since 2015, we've been really presenting digital art in ways that speak to digital artists and speak mm -hmm. to the community that tries to collect. So I think that was, uh, that was a big moment for us. Okay. So for me, at least when I think about what you're up to, and I keep bringing up this term disruptive innovation, Sure. Do you feel that cryptocurrency and art are mutually, because one about blockchain, if, if you think about it, anybody can get a copy of any image. There's in fact, there's JPEGs that have been sold, uh, clips from YouTube, pretty mm -hmm. much anything goes, there's no rules. It's why right. it's blasted open the door of, for what is art. That's what I'm saying. Can you riff on that for a second? Like what, where do you think the boundaries are? Or are there guardrails anymore in terms of digital? I think for digital, and this spoke to something that you kind of touched on for a moment earlier when you were trying to maintain or uh, uh, wrap, like wrap our heads around scarcity, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so the thing is, so for NFTs and digital art, a lot of people are like, why would I buy it? I can just steal it online. You know, <laughs> that's like the, the fast question when people are coming out and trying to understand what an NFT is. And to them, I explain, an NFT is like a certificate of authenticity that exists on the blockchain. So in the same way that yes, of course you can steal anything online, the blockchain and NFTs functionality allows not just provenance, but it allows you the ability to sell it. So that's really the thing is like anybody can steal anything online, but you can't really sell it. Um, NFTs, you can see who minted it. You can see who bought it before you. You can see that it comes from, that it has that provenance. 
and it shows the, you know, the history of the work. And that's what people are buying. They're buying that registry. They're buying the ability to be a part of that chain and that story. And that is the value. Your value is not that you have a JPEG. Your value is that you have the official JPEG. And that's something that people need to recognize is that there is an, you know, there is a blockchain verified provenance. And that's the real watershed moment that we're dealing with is that suddenly you can tell what's an official digital work of art. Okay. So from that point of view, let's talk about um, the near future of this, because I mean, the art world is obviously going through a heavy, intense evolution. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be seeing a tremendous amount of innovation around the finances and on top of that, what art can be. I just want to show you one or two quick examples of things, um, mm -hmm. because we're, what we're going to be seeing, um, I, this is just a little bit of history for the audience. Um, and some of the idea of mashups, remixes, appropriation, but above all, how we look at art and science, um, because this is a kind of science. And mm -hmm. I just want to show the audience really quickly to a couple of things. Um, this is just, I'm just gearing it up here. Okay, so here you go. So this is um, just from two years ago, right before the pandemic. And this is about what would happen in the average 60 seconds on the internet. You, in general, you have over a million Facebook logins, 3.8 million Google search queries, wow. uh, Netflix, uh, over 600,000 hours of video being watched. Um, your average, this is the American economy, by the way, not the global economy. Um, yep. On your average, uh, WhatsApp uh, would have between 40 and 50 million messages being sent. All these numbers radically increased during the pandemic because more and more people were pivoting away from physical space. So let's fast forward to all this. Um, this is an equation that Dr. Leonard Kleinrock wrote in 1962 that set up the, the foundation of the internet as we know it. Um, it was uh, an internet uh, equation set up for what you call ARPANET. And it's fascinating because this could be an NFT, for example. It's basically what it does is it's, it's a mathematical description of when you break up uh, messages and send them to component routers. You know, routers are what makes the entire internet work. So this is um, a Neolithic currency. And for the audience, I just want to make sure everyone out there realizes that there's overlaps of physical versus uh, digital space here. This is a, from a tribe um, on the island of Yap, Y-A-P, in the middle of uh, the South Pacific. And the economist Milton Friedman did his uh, PhD on them because these guys, when you would trade something, they would have a whole group of people carry a stone in front of your house and they would leave the stone. But one day, uh, one of the stones fell in the water uh, because the whole village would know who had made the trade and who had made the transaction. Everyone would say, okay, I traded you 400 coconuts for two cows. Here's one of the stones. But when the stone fell in the water, they couldn't get it. And so they just kept referring to that as the virtual stone. <laughs> so, so this is a kind of the first idea of the, the social ledger. Um, and the, there's a funny phrase where they say the Stone Age didn't end for lack of stone. It ended because people had better ideas. And for me, at least, what your gallery represents is a kind of an update of the similar evolution of the social ledger applied to contemporary art. Um, so this is the Internet. It was formerly called ARPANET in 1969, and the equation I showed you helped set this up. Um, the, the internet basically was started in October 1969. The first routers went live between UCLA and Stanford Research Institute. So when you're thinking about art and digital media in a digital context, we're essentially seeing an evolution of things that came out of what was formerly a military and academic uh, system for sending messages. Uh, the web came about much later in 1988 uh, with Sir Tim Berners-Lee. So these are things that I think inform some of the issues overlapping with the art that you're showing, not by content, but by giving them the platform, the, the overall platform of the, of, of the internet. Um, do you have any thoughts on like where, say for example, when you were growing up, I'm assuming, I'm gonna go ahead and guess you're in your 30s. Um, 40 this year. Okay, I was close. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the, even if a couple of years ago, like in the nineties and early two thousands, it would take like an hour to download, you know, a decent movie. Uh, the internet speeds have gotten much faster, the sheer volume of compression. Um, mm -hmm. so that's where Mark Zuckerberg has been coming up with talking about appropriating the term, the metaverse. Mm -hmm. Um, do you have any thoughts about your near future? Like, like what's next with the gallery? Um, is it going to go further down this sort of digital, uh, route or are you going to do more physical? Well, this is that moment where we're allowing, like we're being allowed to really see uh, the, the meeting point between art and tech. 
you know, it's finally like really, really galvanizing. Mm -hmm. And I think that that that's really exciting because again, when it comes to scalability and getting the, the most people to be influenced by the artwork, ex exposed to the artwork, I think that like we're, we're focusing on tech right now and then we're gonna button hook everything around to have that physical, uh, that physical application because we're not, I love paintings. I'm not giving up on paintings. I'm not giving up on murals or photography or any of these things. I think it's just, how does this all exist in the future? is really important to me. And I think more than anything, how do I get artists money is really, really important to me because that sort of sustainability and that sort of like the resources is, is huge. Um, I think beyond that, when I'm thinking about tech and I'm thinking about the future of this art situation that we're, we're really pushing, it's there are things coming out with 5G that are really going to kind of, uh, they're going to revolutionize how people regard uh, AR and augmented reality. And I think that that's going to be probably the first of many applications that kind of update everything where the same way that everybody takes pictures of each other with the phone, that phone is going to be able to have a layer on it where realistically you'll have different fashion that you're wearing, depending on what, you know, like what you'd like them to see through the phone and not really what they're seeing with their eyes. And I think it's the same thing for walls. I think it's the same thing for artwork, sculpture. Uh, there are so many opportunities now that we're working with different groups to create things that just weren't possible before. So I think that's really exciting to us. Rolling them out slowly is also pretty key because as much as I want everything to happen today and I like being a futurist, most people are you know, they have a lot going on with their lives and need it to be kind of spoon fed because it's overwhelming. You know, the amount of change that's kind of on our doorstep is overwhelming for people. So I think that taking it one step at a time is really important. But beyond that, I think access is kind of the, the thing that's on the top of my list that I'm trying to put attention to right now. Like we're actively, we're working right now with, um, with uh, Black Girls Code mm -hmm. to start to work on a few initiatives that allow, um, there are models right now for getting people cryptocurrency through uh, play to earn. And there's essentially video games that are starting to come out that allow people to earn money by playing them. Mm -hmm. And I really don't want, my, my greatest fear right now with all of this is that it's and it's not about the NFT part, it's not about the art part of this, but it's with the crypto. And I'm just very concerned that like, first of all, we're very, very fortunate to be having this conversation in America where there is access to cryptocurrency because in the same way that I was just saying that there's been this, this jump in value in cryptocurrency, we're very fortunate that we have access to get involved in that in the first place because there are many places in this world that you don't have Wi-Fi, you don't have internet access, and those places are being left behind. Beyond that, financially, the, the, the need of having money to buy into cryptocurrency is another giant hurdle. And the amount of wealth disparity that is on our doorstep and coming on the horizon is like nothing anyone is able to talk about. It is unfucking believable and my goal is to be able to find ways to enable people that don't have access to money, but may have through projects that we do, may have access to technology, get them time in front of some of these games that are work to earn, or excuse me, that are play to earn, and kind of find these opportunities to get, get people from communities that don't have the money and don't have the access and provide access for them to get crypto. Because if they can be involved now and if they can be educated now and be aware of it now, they can be fostering things in their own community that kind of continue to level this up and it kind of gets exponential. And the, from the art side, I really want to be enabling our artists to be creating the aesthetics and the values and the storylines in those play to earn games. 
And it's what's amazing what you were just talking about with AR, VR, XR, just for the audience, I want to unpack those acronyms. One stands for yeah. augmented reality. The other stands for extended reality. And of course, VR stands for virtual reality. Yeah. Um, there's, there's artists like uh, Jaron Lanier, for example, who's generally credited for coining the term virtual reality. But if, say, for example, if in the audience, if you were walking around a couple of years ago, you saw kids at every major college campus walking with their cell phone, they were looking for like Pokemon Go over their phone or something. So what Ed is dealing with is kind of a, a, a kind of a radical forced in, um, evolution of art. Um, yeah. And the way art, I mean, there's a very famous phrase from Marsha McLuhan, who, whose famous book, The Medium is the Massage. He says, um, art is anything you can get away with. <laughs> and, you know, that's this is where this is where we are. Twenty twenty one. Um, I want to be respectful of your time Ed, because it's 157 and to Ty and Nick uh, from the Brooklyn Rail and I see Fong in there. Do you guys want to um, moderate some questions from the audience? Yeah, uh, awesome. not, I'm, yeah. And just, you know, Ed, are you cool with a couple of questions? Absolutely. Yeah. You got me for another half hour. Let's do it. Okay, cool. Um, so Ty, Nick, you guys want to, uh, Fong, you guys want to jump in? Yeah, we can, we can go right into questions. Um, our first question was from Zoom user AS. I'm asking you to unmute now. And if you're unable to, I can, oh, here we go. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, I just wanted to hear about you know, the state of the art with regards to climate. Sure. Yeah, I think that, um, is there if I just jump in? Yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah. I, I just, it's just a general question. It's such a yeah. crisis right now, especially. Absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah. I think it's been, it's been really brought to the center, which is excellent because if there wasn't, if there wasn't public outcry specifically from the art world, this wouldn't have been dealt with for another few years. And I'm really happy that it was something that was, that was centered because the, um, just to tell everybody else, um, what AS is bringing up is, proof of work and proof of work is something that is used to validate and this is gets kind of in the sauce but excuse me it's like validate nodes it's ways that people can uh transfer and exchange um cryptocurrency through these incredibly high powered computers and basically there's a huge electrical drag it's a it uses a lot of electricity to validate this exchange and you know something that isn't brought up too often is those computers when they're not doing this are typically making marvel movies so they're <laughs> like they're working 24 hours a day no matter what's being used for them but those uh those crypto mining situations that have had huge electrical uh needs have been uh currently there's a big movement towards ethereum 2.0 and essentially Ethereum 2.0 leaves the idea of proof of work and exchange and uh, flips into proof of stake. And the way that proof of stake works is that people will take certain amounts of Ethereum and they'll lock it. And that locking it allows it to be uh, verified through a completely different process that uses like, I believe it's 0.001% of the electricity. That's the goal that they're working towards in you know, the next year, basically. But in present time, the thing that's been really excellent about this outcry and this, this, uh, this attention that's been brought to the amount of electricity that's being used is that there's been a giant pivot to, uh, to renewable energy sources. So instead of them using uh, you know, everything that they've been using up to this date, um, it went from, I believe, 30%. Uh, a few months ago, it was only 30 to like 40% of the, the pie was being used by hydro and, uh, and other renewables. Now it's well over 50%. And they're, they're really, what's cool is that a lot of the hydro plants and places that they've been, you know, essentially pulling a ton of electricity, uh, renewable resource electricity, they up to this point, they've only been able to, uh, you can only send that electricity 500 miles and then it dissipates. There starts to be a huge drop off in the amount of electricity. So what they're able to do now is they're taking that overlay or that over overflow that they were typically just like 
they put it into batteries, which are complicated in their own right, as far as like how okay it is to use these renewable batteries and where they're sourcing their materials and all of the footprint that it comes to making those batteries. Um, but they're taking all of this electricity that's being garnered from hydro and from solar and wind, and now they're they're setting up gigantic uh, coin mining farms all around there. So they're financially incentivized to do that because that energy source is free. So that's been a revolutionized moment. And also there was a, a few months ago, they shut down a majority, if not all of the coin mining in China, which like a huge amount of it was, well, a lot of theirs was also from the Three Gorge Dam, but overall it wasn't being done in an efficient way. So when they all had to shut down and there's a lot of them now moving to America to do it here, they're all being focused on, not all, but a vast majority are being focused on renewables because the, essentially they're banking on the greed. And whenever you can optimize and use somebody's greed to do something good, it's finally a system that actually works for humans. So it's, uh, it's pretty great that the moment right now is that it's it's moving in the right direction. I think there's still a lot of work to, uh, you know, a lot to do, but that's what I would say for the environmental update for crypto. Right. And by the way, I want to just chime in there because your average, there's a study that showed your average amount of a Google search, for example, uses about a similar amount of energy as to boil a cup of coffee. So just imagine how much electricity, um, that's just from that particular platform. But if you, if you do a global situation on that, it's, you know, mega- yeah, Matt, yeah, yeah. Look it up. You can just Google. That's crazy. Uh, I'll, I'll Google yeah. it and boil some coffee. Yeah. That's crazy. Right. So there's a sheer volume of electricity just flying around the grid at every level. But the, the, what she, I think, kind of um, alluded to is that the climate crisis is not just about um, switching to renewables, but I personally would love to say it's about decarbonizing altogether and like kind of mm -hmm. getting if you can incentivize other kinds of alternative currencies and other approaches to, to get, like maybe we should make a carbon coin, like how much carbon you pull out of the air would be tied to some sort of incentive uh, to make, to generate coins or something. Um, but all right, so Ty, do you wanna do the next question? And thank you for that question. I'm, I'm glad yeah. you brought up the climate issue. Yeah, thank you, AS. And thank you, uh, Paul and Ed for, for talking on that. Um, we're going to go to a question from GE Schwartz next. GE, you can unmute now. Yeah, hi, this is probably more philosophical, but um, and I love the conversation because it's dispelled a lot of a lot of qualms I had and, and and opened up some wonderful ideas. But I'm still thinking about during the premiere of his film uh, Meetings with Remarkable Men, Peter Brook, who actually appeared here on 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 the rail and SE. Um, the director, he stood be hot before his audience and uh, introducing the film, he said, um, this is not art, not entertainment. Rather, it is the result of one man's search. Now, reading that, I couldn't think, thinking about today, are NFTs, are they art, entertainment, or the result of a searching or yearning of our species overall? You know, hey, Ed, hey Ed, I want to let me just riff for two seconds, then you should respond. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Swope the both of you, actually. Yeah, so, Thank GE, you, you got to remember, uh, it, uh, these are all kinds of speculation. So, if you go back in time, there was this what they call the tulip mania that happened in Holland. Um, and what ended up happening is people would invest in tulips and they became wildly, wildly profitable, and people were making all sorts of colors. And then that market crashed. It's considered one of the early models of what you call a bubble economy. Um, and so the Dutch tulip mania really set the tone for how people thought about speculation. Um, one could argue what I think Ed is doing is actually giving more of a community uh, relationship uh, between the artist and the people who are actually buying the art because the artist then gets a, a you know residuals royalties they can track with the art is um, and they can track the entire web of relationships that the the um, art generates. But that's again, um, Ed. Your this is your thing. I just wanted to kind of just riff for just a moment. Oh, sure. no, I appreciate both of you. To yeah, talk about. It. Um, I think it's all three. I think NFTs are going to be something bigger than we really acknowledge right now. Like our focus is artwork, but they're using NFTs as land registries in Australia. They're using NFTs to uh, share or sell royalty aspects uh, for music now. You know, it's like 
it's just a way NFTs are acting as a way that um, allows a creator to have a one-to-one -one relationship with their collector base. And I think that is the beginning of, it's really just the tip, the tip of the iceberg right now. It's revolutionary. Thank you. Yeah. I think this is how we're going to all understand ownership soon. Okay. Thank you very much. No, you got it. Great question. Um, okay. And now we are going to go to a question from Lynn. Lynn, I'm passing you a mic now. Thank you. This has been fascinating. Um, I'm trying to formulate this question. This is a little out of my comfort zone, but this sounds so benevolent and um, filled with potential. And I'm just wondering whether there's any menace that you um, foresee could happen without the proper uh, strategies put in place. You know, um, is there something that a large corporation could do that would privatize this? Or, I mean, how much of that do Absolutely. you see? How much of your time is spent like being a detective or having people We're track all down some of those? We're all, uh, that's a great question. Um, we're all very concerned about what's going to happen when Instagram enters the chat. Mm -hmm. We're all very concerned on what happens when Facebook gets really involved. But there are, uh, there's so much power in the, the tech arm of this. And they really want this to be, as far as I've been able to tell in these meetings that I've been having with these CEOs, is that they really want to be building something that is built altruistically, that is built with this kind of, the, the thing that's been most kind of uh, calming to me is that structurally, the way that they're trying to do this is that the way the rules are trying to work is that you're not trying to penalize people when they subvert the rules, you're trying to incentivize and reward when they follow them. Mm -hmm. And I think ideologically, that's something that like, is very new, you know, typically we're used to a truncheon in the head when we do something wrong, you know, or legal action being taken when something's done wrong. And the way that they're really building these systems are if you do it the right way, you get bonuses and they incentivize us in that direction. Yeah, the carrot, not sticks for sure. And it's like the, I think that that's as good as we're going to get it in all honesty. I feel like this is this opportunity to kind of like the, the, there's a little saying kind of going around, like if we, um, and I, I'm gonna butcher it, so apologies, but it's like, if, if we create AI to be as good as we are, we're screwed, you know? They have to be better. If, they're, if AI is following the way that we've done things in the past, humanity is on a short ticket. So, you know, the goal is to make something that's a little bit more, um, aiming for the way that we'd like to be rather than the way that we find we are in our worst moments. Mm -hmm. I mean, that makes, that's beautiful. That makes really good sense. And you don't have to answer this specific question, but I just wonder what a potential scenario would be that would turn this very exciting, uh, revolutionary um, path that you're talking about, this project, this way of, of commerce, of being, um, that could sour it. If um, Instagram opens up and they don't do yeah, artists, okay. well, well you, you know, and sorry to jump in again. I just think of like the example of GameStop versus the hedge funders. There was um, a Reddit where these kids were just trading on Robin, which is an, uh, Robinhood is an app. And then Robinhood, because the, the people who owned the uh, app wouldn't let them trade anymore because they were messing with the value and the kids were just, it was called, uh, you know, yeah, it was a huge speculative bubble. Yeah. And, yeah. So Robin maybe they should all be thrown in jail. Yeah, <laughs> they should be so, so then, um, just just to put it bluntly, there's always a dark side, um, yeah. and people will play games with everything. And these were just kids running around, like just, uh, tweeting about like the value of GameStop. I don't know, you know, Ed, do you remember that one? Absolutely, I was involved. Yeah, I was, <laughs> okay. big, I was a big believer. I couldn't believe the. Uh, it was incredible to watch um, community come together and actually try to do. Uh, essentially stock market activism. And there was that moment where it was us versus the banks in that way. And then like, no kidding, the banks just changed the rules in the middle of it. It's like, wow, yeah, right, of course. Why wouldn't they? They're the, <laughs> they're the competition and they're the referee. 
So of course they can do whatever they want. And that was like a real humbling, sad moment. Yeah. Yep. Thanks. So Ty, Ty and Nick, you guys, uh, any other questions for Ed? Yeah, thank you, Lynn, so much for that question. That was great. Um, we, we've been talking a lot in the office about um, wondering how this works for younger people and how they can gain more power outside of the like sort of established art market by using NFTs. So that's definitely yeah. something that we've been thinking about a lot. Um, we are now going to go to questions and comments from the head of our ship, Fong Bui. Fong, you can unmute now. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Paul. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, it's just fascinating because I have little knowledge of this whatsoever. Uh, but I have friends who works on the size of intellectual law. Mm. Um, and actually, one of them have worked, have represented Richard Prince several times. Uh, sure. So it, uh, it, but I think that what Paul said there too, also right, there's always a dark side um, to just remind ourselves then. <laughs> and that I think this is a new, but I also am very impressed with GE brought up Peter Brook Remarkable film, Medium Remarkable Man. Um, and I think that there always a certain kind of marginal um, counter to the mainstream, what is being established. And I think this is where, again, I mean, as artists, artists only, you know, one of the reason, one of the principal reasons that we admire artists, because they don't make easy compromises. And I think I agree with you, Ed, with the pressure that sometimes push them to out of their, their community and then they would feel guilty or mm -hmm. very neurotic about yeah. back and re embrace where they came from. So it's a terrible, you know, friction and rupture. And I know many have suffered deeply through the point of in the terrible perpetual depression. And yeah. not to mention there's no guarantee being an artist. You might be popular for a decade or a few years, and then when you get consumed, you get a label put on you, you'll be spit out uh, and you can't recover either. So that's also something that we have experienced so many artists. Many of my former graduates from Yale or Columbia have been a victim of this, yeah. you know, this uh, <laughs> pandemic, I would say. But but to provide an alternative model, Constant reinventing is a very healthy condition for all of us, really. You know, so for that, I'm, I'm, I'm. I thank you. I, I can't wait to come by and, and visit your, your Please do. and meet you in person and what. That's awesome. And Paul, I mean, I don't know how my our uh, editor lot. We love it, Paul Miller, be able to do what he does. He's more out there than I am. <laughs> I'm almost never in New York. Norm normally, I'm never here. But yeah, the pandemic, uh, my, my schedule, um, it's, I'm always, I keep track of digital stuff. So I was very intrigued when I heard about Super Ch uh, Chief NFT, because you got to remember galleries, the business model is based on scarcity and curated access to the paintings. So if, if a collector, like, yeah, I'll give you a hypothetical, the Rubels show up at the Jeffrey Deitch, they mm -hmm. will get that painting or whatever before the opening is even open. But with digital art, um, the, it's much more of a kind of a crazily democratic, but mixed with meritocratic because people are trying to figure out the currencies. There's an educational component. Mm -hmm. And above all, um, it's, it's wildly freewheeling. I mean, this it's anything goes right now. I mean, I really think, and I free, yeah. And it really frees you up from the, the sort of normal rules and regulations of the normal art world. Um, and that's, that's why I thought it would be great to, to see if, uh, you know, the super chief would do a dialogue. Um, that's so great. Yeah, super cheap is super cool. I appreciate you. <laughs> and we appreciate Paul, you know, last week just talked to Antoine Sargent and now today with you at Zipco. Awesome. Just terrific. That's exactly right. what I call imminently democratic. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Thank you. Back to you guys. Back to you, Ty. Thank you, Fong. Um, okay, and now. At the rail, we have a tradition of closing with poetry. And today I have the honor of welcoming our poet laureate of the day, Benga Arashina, to the stage. 
Nigerian poet and essayist Vanga Adashina is the author of Painter of Water, a haunting meditation on intimacy in the face of war and historical violence, which was selected for the New Generation African Poet series. Vanga's work has been published in Prairie Schooner, Harvard Review, Academy of American Poets, Poem a Day, and the New York Times. He was a Goldwater Fellow at NYU, where he received his MFA, and has received fellowships and support from the Fine Arts Work Center, Callaloo, Poets House, and Colgate University, where he was the Olive B. O'Connor Fellow. He is the winner of the 2020 Narrative Prize. Venga, let's hear it. I'm so excited. Alrighty, thank you for having me. That was that was such an awesome conversation about hearts and and you know um, such work at a time like this. So I'm going to read three poems in quick succession, uh, and and we'll be good. The first one is called "Ode to What I Did Not Know." Two animals, doe hide, sleek across the road into the femur of the night. Their feet learn the reptile skin of earth, dark roots and the tethering of dreams. I wake up away from myself. The fast animals of my eyes crouch through tickets into a sky colored beach where I suddenly look up and see that my tongue is a country of birds. The water twists like a snake to taste itself. Water says, you know, I have never tasted of myself. I do not know myself. On a morning radio show about lines and colors, a man phoned in. There was a child howling in the house of his mouth. He said, please listen to me, please, I'm prejudiced. His voice cracked, I need help. What spilled out of the stereo lay on my floor, breathing. It had fours, so dark, Lord, the fees of it. Some night I wake up panting, knowing that I'm a stranger with accent, homeless in the childhood country of my body. Some night I clench my fist, my teeth. I try hard to not turn on my bed. I fear what leaves in me might spill out and darken the floor. A knife, not silence, slice through oars. What is loss if not your body refusing to give you back to yourself? All right, second one very quickly. This is called I Carried My Father Across the Sea. He was a child. He was dead. He was the shaft of a long-tailed astrapia. He was a forest of bruise. He wore a door on his face. He wore the black suit of his wedding. The square pocket was still full of his vows. It was light to carry. His burdens and vows had bled out of him. He was heavy with the responsibility of the dead. What sort of a son leaves his father chained to fatherhood? I lifted and propped him up with my frame. I measured the length of him with my lens, the feet stuck in sea sand, his weak knees, his arms gripped my sides. As the currents rose, the collar on his broken neck flared into a float. The gash, the surgeon's knife left on his head became a hollow. it signaled in the dark. I put my nose to his nose. I put my finger in his mouth. I tied his high V tubes, now a human gill around our waist and swam in the vein of the water. Look, a sphinx in the waves said, a son carries a father. Death is not silence. It is where I hear you most clearly. What sort of a son leaves his father's body chained to the dark grievance inside the earth? I carried my father on my back. I felt the brazen inside his afterlife heart on the skin of my spine. He wore his face as a door. He promised to open to me. He bled out his vows. 
All right, and the last one, again, thank you so much for having me. I like hanging out with artists, the galleries, this, you know, this is really dope and cool people, you know, not, poor, <laughs> not poor like poets, you know. So it's always a joy to hang out with them. The last one for today, again, thank you so much for having me. This is called Surrender. A mercy puts a thing on my palm and it's my childhood. It's tiny, endless moth city. It's rind like grace or tenderness or sorrow. In the red brick room, my father cries. His cries are small, lonely animals. I carry them with me like an inheritance. Once I ran out of a room because the song on the radio was a feast in the nuke of my neck. I stood on the street quietly weeping, though when a woman said to me, child, are you well? I said it was the waters within me that wanted to make themselves known. Some nights are like that. They do not let you go until they are broken into the secret July in your heart where you hide all things. All I wanted was to be home, so I dipped myself under the earth, by which I mean I entered the subway station. It was there I heard him, a man that was also a sound. He was singing, tree branches broke inside his voice. There was in his chorus the quietude of a thing that was coming to an end. The song he was singing, he said it was not a dirge, though he sang it to a thing that was dying. Wishing away was the kind of song my father sang as he lay dying. My father said his song was not a dirge, though he sang it to a thing that was dying in himself. He said, son, my song is a joy, but a joy with sharp knives. So my laughter is a thing with a sharp edge, and my joy a trembling. This man I saw, his locks of hair, which ran down to his neck, were the visible borders of a country that was inside him. And the sound he made was the secret language of a nation unto which immigrants were called. It was as though I had sliced through the ocean and arrived here only to run into my childhood. And I did not want to make myself open, but I was made open for certain songs, do not ask your permission. I raised my hands and moved toward him, naked before the song. I said, dear music, dear childhood, take me, take me. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Benga. That was really, Really amazing. Thank you. That was so beautiful. I'm, I'm seeing that we're all incredibly touched by your words. Um, and thank you, uh, Paul and Ed, for this conversation today. Sure. And thank you all who tuned in and for all of your questions. All of us are leaving this conversation today thinking of Banga's amazing work and of how we can use our digitality to deconstruct the power of the systems that harm us and how we can collectivize towards liberation. Join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for our 48th Radical Poetry Reading, curated by Pierre Doris, featuring poetry read by Alan Fisher, Randall Horton, Laylee Long Soldier, and Tracy Morris, some of whom are some of my favorite poets. And now you can all turn on your microphones and say goodbye as you leave. All right, thanks everybody. And thank um, just by way, one last little thing. Um, thank you, Ty, and thank you, Nick, and thanks, Fong, um, and of course, um, Ed, your gallery is awesome. I'm really happy to see the innovation and just um, thank you everybody for joining us. It's always a special treat uh, to do in the Brooklyn Rail. So thanks everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Wow. Thanks, Benga. Thanks, Benga. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Bye bye. Thank you.